Riding shotgun refers to the practice of sitting next to the driver in a moving vehicle. The term riding shotgun came around after the time of the stagecoach when somebody used to sit next to the driver holding a shotgun in case they ran into bandits. My name is Charlie Cook and I drive a lot. I like to talk to people while I'm driving, so I interview people in my car while I'm driving. Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Charlie. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Riding Shotgun with Charlie. We are back in Edison, New Jersey with Rosie David Rosenthal. Thank you for being on. It's a pleasure. It's my pleasure. So Rosie is with the CNJFO, the Coalition of New Jersey Firearms Owner. We're going to talk about CNJFO. We're going to talk about uh, the hog hunts that you do. That's Sound fantastic. Like plan? Mm -hmm. We just had an awesome lunch at Harold's in Edison. Harold's and Edison. So this was crazy. The price of the, the sandwich was ridiculous, but it was about this high, and uh, it was it was huge. It was huge. Yep, Charlie. Delicious. Charlie actually enjoyed a nice goy sandwich. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> we right. didn't ask for mayonnaise, though. I did not ask for mayonnaise. Uh, which way do we go to get out here? Let's go this way. We'll go that way. All right. So we're in Edison, Edison, New Jersey. The last time I was in Edison is when I interviewed um, Tony Simon. Yeah, Tony and I are really good friends, and he lives in Middlesex County, about 20 minutes from here. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, he was. Uh, it was. It was cool to get him. I was excited when I put a picture up of um, uh, the picture up, and you posted. You're like, oh my God, this totally just happened. Tony Simon went riding shotgun with Charlie. Yeah. And now here we are with you. Make a right out of here. Take a right. All right. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Rosie. Well, I've been behind the trigger for 47 years. I started when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I'm 59 now. I'll be 60 uh, in August. And we're doing uh, quite well uh, with the coalition. Um, I'm doing more mentoring now than I am doing shooting. What are we doing here? In, we're making a right. 514? Yeah. West? Or east? Uh, east. East, all right. Follow all this traffic. Follow all the trap. Where's everybody going? They're going that way. All right, we're gonna uh, make a break. There you go. It's not going. Um, so you've been shooting for a long time. Yeah. What did you start shooting? Um, what or when? Well, uh, both. Well, it's an interesting story, really, and I told it um, to a group of people down in Centered in New Jersey for the very first time in January. I started about 1971 when I was 12 years old. Stay right. Yeah. All righty. And uh, my father handed me a five dollar bill and said, "Go into Kmart and get us some ammo." <laughs> okay. So it was myself, my brother, my sister, and uh, my dad, and we were going yeah. and uh, out to the range. It was English Town. They were still open at the time. He handed me a $5 bill. I went in and I saw 60,000 rounds of ammo, 500 round boxes, uh, on, a, on a point of purchase display, right out in front of God and everybody. Wow. And as a 12 year old kid, I grabbed a, a brick of ammo, went up to the register, laid it on the belt, handed the lady the $5 bill, and she, she gave me change back from $3.99 plus tax. Oh my gosh. 500 rounds for four bucks. Yeah. Un Don't forget the tax. <laughs> and as soon as I get back, as soon as I get back to the car, my dad says, "There's change, right?" <laughs> change, yeah. change from your hands to his. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so yeah, um, been doing this quite a while. Cool. You know, all different calibers. I'm into the black powder thing. Um, I was the country's. Uh, first ever double distinguished expert in black powder in the Winchester marksmanship program. Wow. A number of years ago. That's pretty I had, cool. Yeah, I had earned my DX in rifle 
and then uh, I was the first person to earn a DX in pistol. Uh, what's the DX? Uh, distinguished expert. Distinguished expert. Gotcha. Yeah, it's the highest level that you can attain. Is uh, this is the same thing? Like when I teach, uh, when I teach some of the NRA classes, they have the the Winchester book, mm -hmm. uh, and that's following that, right? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, the gentleman that uh, urged me to start uh, that way, uh, his name is Lance Brunner, mm -hmm. and he's from Clark, New Jersey. Uh, he and his wife are big into black powder, own an extensive collection, and uh, they twisted my arm to uh, go for the uh, distinguished expert. And he got a hold of the NRA, and the reason he had to do that was because basically the NRA had uh, made a mistake in their in the way that they presented the program with the scoring you had to do at the distance. Uh, strong hand only at 50 yards and put 8 out of 10 shots in a 10x ring size of a dollar. Wow. And since the Winchester program is designed so kids can also earn, you know, ranks with this, there was no way you were going to get some kid to go up there oh my gosh, 50 yeah. yards strong hand only. So <laughs> there were some adjustments made to that and uh, I was able to qualify. Oh, that's cool. How old were you? Um, back then, uh, I was probably about uh, a little over 50. A little over 50? A little over 50, yeah. <laughs> So it wasn't that long ago? No. <laughs> were you always into shooting black powder? Um, yeah, I, I got infected uh, by my father. I got infected. <laughs> yeah, there's worse things he could infect you with, right? Yes, there are. Are we going to be taking a ride up here? Can we get in the traffic um, that's moving? We're going to we're going to stay here, okay? Because we don't want to go back to Staten Island. We do not. Okay. We do not. Yeah. Not another bridge toll. Oh my God! Nineteen bucks for the toll. Holy moly! Yeah, going over the. Uh, uh, I call the it the against the V. Yeah, Verrazano. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I can't call it the other thing. I don't want to piss anybody off. <laughs> right. All right, some nine south. Yeah. All right. So you've been shooting a long time. You didn't get uh, you, your your father infected with the black powder. Mm -hmm. Black powder rifles, black powder handguns. Uh, cap and ball revolver. Cap and ball revolver. Yep, that's how we started us out. Very cool. Yeah, four fifty one round ball and twenty five grains of powder. Yeah. And an eighteen fifty eight new model army. Wow. Do. You, <sighs> They make replicas of those, don't they? Yes, it, it, this was a replica. Okay. My dad used to collect the actual real guns. Really? Yes. From the 1850s? Yes, and he he grew up in Pittsburgh, and he used to spend a lot of time in Gettysburg. This is before they closed Gettysburg off to, uh, you know, people picking up uh, lead balls in the battlefield. Wow. That's pretty wild. Yep. Um, let me ask you about... Uh, Black powder in, in, in New Jersey. Um, do you have to have a permit? Do you have to not have a permit? Since uh, it's an antique firearm? Well, here's the thing. If it's a handgun and you buy it in New Jersey, you need a permission slip. Okay. Known as a P2P or a uh, permission to purchase. If it's a long gun, then you fill out a certificate of eligibility. And now even long guns in New Jersey have to be transferred at an FFL. So you have to pay a processing fee. For black powder? You have to pay a processing fee to transfer black powder in New oh Jersey. Gosh. But if you put $15 into the gas tank and you drive over to Pennsylvania, you can buy all the black powder you want, okay? And it's, it's it, federally, it's not even a firearm. So in, in Massachusetts, Primitive primitive arms, or what they call them, uh, black powders, primitive arms, you do not have to have a permit for, and you do not have to have a permit for the powder, but you have to have a permit to purchase the powder. Okay. You don't have to have a permit for Jersey to purchase the powder yet. Of course, yeah. after this airs, they'll... That's right. They're, they're going to say, hey, we got hey, to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. It's it completely screwed up. Like somebody's going to go into the first, the second, and the third national bank, and they're going to start robbing banks with a cap and ball revolt. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Although I will tell you this, I did see somebody in the news in Springfield, Massachusetts, a couple weeks ago, 
they were caught selling drugs and they had a uh, they had it it looked it looked almost like an old Sheffield a Smith and Wesson Sheffield yeah and uh, it, it was a it was a 44 and they're like this guy's got a 44 revolver and I'm like part of me's like man I told I get you know he's a young guy and he's selling drugs they caught him with drugs as well uh, I get all that he shouldn't have it but it's a primitive firearm yeah so uh, and you he don't he, have to have a permit well no powder in a gun no no balls in the gun so yeah. you can't shoot anything right and no caps it's just a paperweight okay it's just a paperweight yeah just a okay paperweight. And the picture I saw, the thing looked like it was starting to rust together anyway, from right. somebody not cleaning it. Yeah. So the the cylinder probably couldn't even turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Ridiculous. The gun grabbers don't care about that. Right. They want us. To, they want everyone to think it's a Glock. Well, yeah. With a thirty-three round, <laughs> yeah, thirty-three <laughs> round, round mag. Uh, tactical mag. <laughs> right. The walking stick. Yeah. All right. So you've been shooting for a long time. You became the distinguished expert with the black powder. Tell us about CNJFO. When did you start this? Why did you start this? And I want to get into the things that you do, that uh, that you guys do. Well, uh, essentially we started it, uh, Matt Andrus and I got together. He's our president. Mm -hmm. And uh, he hit me up uh, to work on some bylaws. And then we determined that uh, we would be better off, instead of trying to change one organization, uh, to essentially uh, form our own. So together with Dan Gurdovich, Jack Pyle, and Jan Nepper, the five of us became uh, trustees of the very big corporation and formed our own nonprofit known as the Coalition of New Jersey Firearm Owners, which is a 501c3 charitable and educational nonprofit, both state and federal. It Does it a lot of work to set something like that up? Um, it's hundreds of dollars worth of application fees, mm -hmm. and thank God that we got uh, Jack Pyle, who's a CPA, uh, to, fi to file everything with the state and the feds. Gotcha. So uh, we got a letter of determination back from the Internal Revenue Service approving our C3 status. So we're a charitable and educational nonprofit in all 50 states. That's cool. That is, uh, that's something to be proud of. So if somebody seeing this video wants to help us out, where can they find you? At cnjfo.com. All right. I will definitely put some links onto that. Cool. Uh, how many people are involved in the group? So you said there's the, the four or five of you guys. Well, that, those, that's just the trustees. Okay. Okay. Then we have, um, an executive committee, uh, featuring a whole bunch of, uh, different people, uh, probably, uh, you know, too many to name because uh, I know I'm going to for, forget you know, somebody. Going right. to forget somebody. That's going to be the guy up. that gets you know yeah. most pissed off. Yeah, you know. But everybody that's there is a volunteer, and cool. they're doing it out of uh, out of love for the Second Amendment nice. and, and wanting to see you know the organization uh, succeed and its you know promise to get rid of some of this onerous gun laws that we have in New Jersey. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are crazy. Well, for instance, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't pretend to be one on TV, right. but I know this much. Uh, all firearms in New Jersey are inherently illegal. They start out that way. <laughs> Great. Every every firearm is illegal. i take a right. Okay. And it exists in the hands of us serfs solely through the use of exceptions and exemptions in what's known as the 2C firearm statutes for the state of New Jersey. Wow. That's ridiculous. They have pages and pages and pages of, of exemptions, okay? Um, active duty uh, military, okay? National Guard, uh, part-time National Guard part-time police officers, okay? Line after line after line of exemptions. If you're going to and from the range, there's an exemption for that. But what there's not an exemption for, if Mr. Bad Guy breaks into your house <laughs> and you have a gun laying on your desk or the bureau or, you know, next to the Easily bed. Easily accessible. All right. If, if someone else in that dwelling that's not registered to that firearm actually uses it, it's technically a trouble. violation of the law 
although nobody has ever gotten jacked up for it. Mm. Because in all 21 counties of New Jersey, you're not going to find a prosecutor that's going to arrest the missus for taking out the bad guy while the bad guy's trying to bludgeon her husband to death. Wow. But the law is but there. the law is there. If they want to feel like playing with it. So in Massachusetts, it's similar. If you have to keep the guns locked and secured so unauthorized people don't have access to it. An unauthorized person is anyone that doesn't have a permit. So if the husband, and I'm whatever, stereotyping here. If the husband has the license and the wife doesn't, if she... Uh, if she knows how to get and have access to the gun, she's gone shooting, she knows how to use it, somebody breaks in, she uses the gun, successfully defends herself in her home. This, uh, after, I, I always say during class, after um, they've proved themselves to be uh, justified, the state's going to come back and slap the husband with an improper storage fine because she shouldn't have had access to the gun. Isn't that amazing? It's ridiculous. So you're the victim of a crime, and they're going to make you pay to be the victim of a crime. Of course. And it's like, tw- I want to, you know, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I want to say it's like 2500 bucks. 2500 bucks. Now, when they get done playing that game, um, if she decides to actually go for the permit, does that count as a black mark against her and deny her the ability <laughs> to actually get the permit? That's a great question. That is, a, I have no idea. Okay. I've never thought of that. Completely ridiculous. Sounds like. Now, uh, you guys had something happen here in that we've had in Massachusetts since 1994, when the federal assault weapon ban went into effect. We had the 10 round magazine restriction. Uh, we can have pre ban 94s, but we cannot have post ban 94s. And in 1998, they permanently adopted the assault weapon ban, air quotes assault weapon ban, um, and have the 10 round magazines. Mm-hmm. So if somebody bought a Smith and Wesson M and P that has a 15-rounder. The 15-rounder is illegal to have in Massachusetts, so they, the dealers can't sell them, but if somebody brought one, uh, bought one in free America and brought it to back to Massachusetts, it's, it's illegal. And you guys did something like that down here. Yes, we did. Uh, last June, it got uh, signed, and it had a six-month <laughs> waiting period. By Governor Free Stuff. <laughs> By Governor Free Stuff. Hi, Anthony. Hey. <laughs> um, I don't yeah. even know his real name. I know him as Governor Free Stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, Governor <laughs> Phil Murphy. Yes. Okay. Oh. Yep. Anyway, so so six he, months. Yep, six months. So December the tenth, um, all the eleven plus round magazines uh, became contraband, and even though the State NRA Association and JRPC uh, sued uh, to you know and tried to get a stay and everything else from the yep. law being put into effect. Um, you it, stand on nine? Yep, we can stay on nine. All right. Uh, even though that happened, um, the law still went into effect. And what was interesting is a Freedom of Information Act notice just got published on Facebook not too long ago. And no high cap magazines were turned in to any of the state police barracks anywhere in the 21 counties of New Jersey. Really? Really. That's interesting. So I can only assume that they didn't have any... We must only assume that everybody is 100% legal and that all the magazines were either destroyed or transported out of state. Right. Shameless plug for gun sitters, right? Gun sitters would take those? Oh, yeah. Uh, You know, there was a a deal worked out where uh, for a very small amount of money they would take them. Um, I myself uh, had my son transport uh, 46 and a half years worth of magazines. Wow. Okay, before the deadline. To a free state? He he lives in Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh. Okay. I even had friends of mine mail their magazines to him. (laughs) So he's got this... He has a cache. He has a cache of high cap mags. Of high cap mags, <laughs> and he doesn't even have a gun for any of them. Oh my gosh! Okay. Now, I do, do what they call that criminal intent here in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, no, uh, not at all. Okay. It, it, as long as they were disposed of properly before the deadline, uh, you were fine. Wow. Now, I figured this out. Um, Anthony talked about this a lot. Anthony from Gun For Hire. He talked about it's uh, 18, 18 months? 18 months of magazine. Sentence. I had 31 mags. 
Wow. That's 46 and a half years of time. In the clink. Yes. Unbelievable. Okay. It's, it's completely ridiculous. I just saw something uh, that I, I shared on my Facebook page about in, in Massachusetts they want to take away the life sentence without parole and have it be at 25 years uh, and then parole is now what the life sentence is going to be. So you would go to jail longer for the magazines you have with no criminal intent and no criminal activity, just merely possession of these magazines. Oh, it, it gets even better. <laughs> um, since no intent has to be proven in order to be jacked up for it, uh, there's plenty of widows right now mm -hmm. that are sitting on stuff that they don't even know they own. Oh, right, which would make them... Felons. They're, they're felons in waiting. Felons in waiting. Okay. Unbelievable. If their house catches fire and, and the cops come in and the fire department starts ripping the house apart to find where the fire started, and the place the fire started just happens to be somewhere near where the husband stored whatever. Right. Okay. Now they start bringing 50 caliber ammo cans out onto the front lawn and popping them open, making sure that the rounds aren't ready to cook off and they discover high cap mags, they can lock her up. Unbelievable. This is really screwed up. Yeah. Really screwed up. That's why we fight every day, Charlie. Every day. Every day we fight. It's, cr it's crazy. One of the uh, things we use is our website, but uh, primarily in order to reach thousands of people um, at the flick of a switch, uh, you know, we're big into uh, putting notices out on uh, Facebook. You know, I'll admit it. I'm the spammer in chief, <laughs> and and I'll do between forty and fifty um, different pages to spread the word out. And every once in a while, I'll 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 see my analytics, you know, bottom out because they catch on to what I'm doing. Yeah. But sometimes they don't. And we broke a story that's viral now. It went re-viral this last week, uh, March of last year. There was two high school kids in Lacey Township, New Jersey, that decided to take a couple of pictures and post them on Instagram. I, this sounds familiar. Yes. Like I said, it went viral. Mm -hmm. So this was March of last year, 2018. Mm -hmm. Well, we found out about it through one of our members, and he got me in, interested in it, and I checked it out. And then Blackwire Media actually broke the story. Wow. And then our communications director, Teresa Einicker, uh, she tweeted about it, and the tweets went all the way to Eric Trump. Wow. So they hit the first family. <laughs> That's cool. 2.3 million people reached That's on that amazing. news breaking story. That's pretty amazing. On Facebook. That is pretty amazing. My computer was popping so fast with everybody liking the story and spreading it, mm -hmm. the screen couldn't keep up. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So that was the biggest one to date. That is pretty big. Now you guys, uh, in order to help do all this stuff, you guys do some really cool fundraisers. Yes, we do. In order to keep alive. We do uh, pheasant hunts, hog hunts, sporting clays, and uh, recently we did a wing ding meet and greet at a local pizzeria where the owner of the place uh, almost closes his business down and we pack it with about 45 patriots and they all pay about 22 bucks a head to uh, do an all-you-can-eat uh, pizza and wings party. Oh, very cool. Yep. Very cool. And then we do uh, a 50-50 Mm -hmm. And uh, we raffle off swag from different sponsors, you know, that uh, appreciate what we're trying to do. And, you know, we'll pull in, you know, if we're lucky, we'll pull in four digits that night. That's cool. Yeah. That's way cool. You know, so we're clawing and scratching. It's not like, you know, we're, uh, we're hitting the big time or anything. But, right. Uh, but you know what? This is, this is what's important to me. It's important that people are out there doing something and getting something done and that they're actually doing this because a lot of people just sit and complain and hey how come nobody's doing this how come nobody's doing this somebody should do something and they don't realize that there are people doing this because they're too tied up in whatever else it is that people do and they, well, they miss all this stuff they in, miss the in Jersey we're taxed to death 
So sometimes what I say is, you know, the only thing people volunteer for is overtime. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> okay. Sometimes they don't have time, you know, to actually put extra hours in, mm -hmm. you know, every week doing something. But right. there's plenty of committee positions available. And you don't necessarily have to even live in New Jersey to be on a committee and help. Oh, that's cool. You know, you can actually be, you know, a patriot that has escaped New Jersey. You know, a retired patriot in Florida or South Carolina or wherever. Right. And if you got an extra hour or two a week and you your heart's still in Jersey and you want to help us because you got family here, hit us up. All right. We can use the help. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of stuff, if you're just social media and stuff, it doesn't really matter where where you're at. No. You know? We have writers from all over New Jersey that are freelance, unpaid, uh, that I edit stuff for, okay? I don't like having my name on everything that I post. Sure. So I just use uh, Blackwire Media for everything. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So it's not, you know, rosy, rosy, rosy. It's... It's just black wire media on the banner line with a date mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a, a hot link uh, to join the organization. Oh, that's cool. And I throw a headline in there and and then format it so that uh, Facebook picks it up and runs with it instead of, uh, you know, knocking it down into the basement. Mm -hmm. This I, I did not know this. There is a, there's a formula for writing a press release. I had no idea about this. Yeah, basically... Um, well, I never had any college, so I'm doing all of this on a 12th grade education. Okay? That's, that's it's called amazing. the Inverted Triangle, mm -hmm. and it was taught to me in 1976 okay. by my journalism teacher. Yeah. Because journalism was a class in high school back then. And the Inverted Triangle means you take all the important stuff and get it in the first sentence or two. Mm -hmm. of your lead paragraph. Gotcha. And it's the five W's. Who, what, what, when, when where, where, and why. why. Yeah. And if you can do that in one long sentence or two sentences, then you'll get all your information across, even on somebody that's just flipping through phone messages while they're waiting at the doctor's office. Very cool. That's a good way to do it. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. The inverted so it's triangle. The inverted triangle. That's, that's pretty interesting. Well, the same thing applies today, even you know, with uh, Facebook and Twitter and everything else. You know, you're, you're limited by the number of characters or uh, number of paragraphs, mm -hmm. depending on what, uh, you know, program or function you're doing. Right. And it, it works. And you get your message out there. That's good. Yeah. There's always time for fluff at the, at the back end if somebody wants to open it up. You know, right. click on it and open up the whole thing. Right. Very cool. Tell us about the hog hunts. I want to hear about these. These, because okay. I see you posting pictures all the time, <laughs> on and I'm like, is, is he hunting hogs again? Is he doing this again? Like, how many pictures does he take at one hog hunt? And and I don't want to say milking it in a negative way. No. But how many pictures is he taking? Well, we try to get a bunch of different people to submit pictures of their harvests. Okay. Okay. The last hog hunt, we had 13 hunters, including myself. Wow. That's okay. cool. It takes place on a 150-acre island mm -hmm. uh, a little south of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in the middle of the Susquehanna River. And the hunters are boated out to the island in a small outboard. The hogs are already on the island. They've been populated okay. at that point. And we set up a, a, a driven hunt uh, whereby um, we establish one common firing line and then uh, the guided hunt uh, takes place. And if you spot a hog, you call out, and then the guide comes over, and they make sure that everything's clear behind it, because it's, you know, basic NRA safety. Know your shot and what's behind it. Right, know your target, what's behind you. Exactly. Okay. So that's maintained, and, you know, it's fun, and you get to put uh, some food on the table. Very cool. My hog hunt uh, that I just did was in January, and I still have uh, plenty of hog left in the freezer. I get thick sliced bacon, and half my pork chops I get smoked. Nice. Half my hams I get smoked, the other half I get fresh. 
cool. Yeah, a whole bunch of things. The, uh, does the the hunting grounds do they take care of all that, or do you bring it home and um, slice it up yourself? Well, we we drop it off at a at a butcher shop mm -hmm. that's also a sponsor. Convenient. Okay. Very exactly. Convenient. All right, and that's uh, V Roche and Son, and they're in White House Station, New Jersey. Hi, Vinny. And I will put a link in for those guys. Yep. And uh, they do a terrific job. Uh, one of my Facebook friends uh, uh, works there as well. And uh, they've been doing our hogs now uh, for years. Um, they work for a small little company called Johnson & Johnson. You may have heard of them. <laughs> I think I have, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the 80-year-old guy that owns the butcher shop gets a tea time anytime he wants from J&J. &J. Wow. He's pretty big to do. At Trump National. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. He's, <laughs> that's and, cool. And, yeah. And when, uh, you know, J&J, uh, &J, when any of the J&J &J people uh, hunt anything anywhere in the world and it's transported back mm -hmm. in quarters or whatever, that that's... shop gets the job. Wow. That's... So they have it worked out where, you know, as a courtesy, he can call for a tea time anytime he feels like <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right, what else? Tell us some more stuff. Are you are you um are you a regular hunter? Do you just hunt hogs? Do you hunt deer? Do you hunt I tried deer hunting once. I yeah. froze my ass off. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh my circulation isn't as good as it should be and it necessitated me um basically giving up uh, deer hunting because I'm not moving around making the blood move. So what wound up uh, working out best for me was uh, pheasant hunting and, cool. uh, and doing the uh, hog hunts. Gotcha. Uh, deer hunting for me is sitting in a tree stand with a bow and arrow, same sort of thing, freezing my tail off, reading a book, dropping it, taking a nap, and wondering what I'm doing. So I'm like, all right, this, I want to harvest the deer. I think it'd be cool and get me in touch with nature and all that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. But I, I don't have the time for it. I don't have the time or the patience. Yeah, well, you know, I like I said, I gave it a shot. It, yeah. It, I have some of the patience required, but not a lot. Because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I need to move around a little bit. Otherwise, I stiffen up really bad. Sure. So I'm not really built for it. But you do a lot of shotgunning, though. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. So uh, pheasant hunting would be... Uh... I actually pheasant hunt with a 10-gauge side-by-side. Really? Yeah. That's got to kick a little bit. A black powder muzzle-loading <laughs> shotgun. A muzzle-loading shotgun? That sounds like Matter of fact, I brought it with me today you... for riding shotgun with Charlie. Where is it? We can't drive around with it, can we? No. <laughs> no. I could put it in the back. <laughs> I was wondering how you're going to pull that off. Like, should we get a picture with it at the? Uh, sure, let's get a picture. Can we get of a it. picture? All right, let's okay. do it. Okay, let's great. do that, and then we'll get back in the car before the cops. Before come. the cops come, right? It's a good thing this is a rental. <laughs> They'll never trace it back to us. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Well, in New Jersey, you were allowed to transport. Uh, as long as you have a firearms ID card, and you don't need to be at a, a specific exempt location. Oh my Remember what I said about all those pages of exemptions? Right. Well, one of them is if you have a get-out-of-jail card, known as a New Jersey Firearms Purchaser ID card, which I've had since I was 18 years old. Cool. So we, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty fun. Yeah, it would. When I saw you with the car, I'm like, okay, he said he has a shotgun. Is he taking it out? How is this going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking about bringing it out in the case, okay, because I have a camo case for it. Yeah. But there was two New Yorker-looking <laughs> people watching every move I make because of the big crossed guns emblem right. shirt that I'm wearing. The big orange 2A supporter shirt. Yeah, you can't miss me in a parking lot. No. Not with this 2X thing. No, not at okay. all. Okay. Tony says... He's pound for pound, the biggest 2A guy in New Jersey. Well, I'm not quite as big as Tony, but with this orange thing, I make up for it. <laughs> You're sticking out just as much. <laughs> My original idea for riding shotgun was to um, to have a truck and put uh, put 
you know, have a whatever, a small cab truck and put a, a couple Put a of, gun rack right yeah, in the back. Yeah, put a gun rack right in the back. Yeah. And so the fun thing in Massachusetts is I asked John Green, who's my gun guru, he's, he's with the Gun Owners Action League, I asked him, I said, hey, uh, is this legal to do? He said, it's completely legal to do as long as it's a non-large capacity rifle, uh, non-large capacity rifle or shotgun, you can have it not in a case in, uh, in the window. Uh-huh. He said, but bring a copy of the laws for when, not if, you get her pulled over. <laughs> Because exactly. you said you will get pulled it over. It will happen. Yeah. So then I thought, I'm like, hmm, what if I got a truck and I got like a big, one of those silhouette stickers, right? And it yeah. just looks like there's a shotgun in there. There you go. <laughs> like put that on the back window. That'd be kind of fun. There you go. I haven't done that yet. I haven't, um, I haven't, I guess I haven't been out enough to free America where I can. Uh, well, uh, New Jersey's not exactly free America. We joke around. We call it the Communist Republic. <laughs> the or the Communist, Communist People's Republic. Republic. Yes. Totally. Yes. Yeah. That would be fun. I have uh, some of the people I've interviewed, of course, I've carried with. Um, I interviewed some guys in Florida a couple months ago. At, I was speaking at one of their events, and I open carried. And I'm not an open carry guy. Okay. So I open carried. It was new. It was a little strange. Not a big deal because everyone else was doing it. And in Florida, you can open carry, uh, you can open carry when you're going to or from hunting, camping, or fishing. Mm-hmm. So we were camping. I could open carry without a permit while we're camping or going to and from the camping event. So the whole camping event, I get to carry. I interviewed people when I was down there. After the whole camping event was done, I interviewed the gentleman that hosted me, Kevin Sona. And when I went with him, I couldn't carry. But I could carry for the other day and a half. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah, that's gun law for you. Yeah. They really don't make any sense. What do you think about national reciprocity? I think it's long overdue. Yeah? I would uh, love for it to actually be forced right down everybody's throat. Mm. I don't know what everybody is so scared about. Um, People that I know that carry are the nicest people in the world. And they go out of their way to be nice because they're carrying. Because they don't want anybody pointing a finger saying, He's got a gun! He's got a gun! Absolutely. Absolutely. The the gun folks I've been meeting, they're they're really the nicest people. Um, They're happy to hang out with you, happy to tell you stories, happy to take you shooting, happy to Mm -hmm. fill in the blank, happy to help out however they can. My concern with national reciprocity is... And, and I love the idea. I think it's great. I think it's smart. I, I think it's freedom. My concern is in Massachusetts, in New Jersey, they have the 10-round magazine ban. So mm-hmm. if somebody from Pennsylvania comes over here with a 15-rounder, now they become a felon. Why stop at 15? Pennsylvania doesn't have a 15 uh, Okay, well... They can okay. have a 33 They can have mag- a 33 walking rounder. stick. Nice. But if they bring that in here and they don't know what the laws are... Then they become a felon. And of course. They can't New Jersey would be happy to lock their ass up. Yeah. It's pathetic. I also don't know if I want the federal government saying, these are the requirements in order for you to be able to exercise your rights. Well, yeah. I mean, that they've done that in other rights. Even with the right of free speech. All right? Free speech has been limited ever since somebody decided you can't scream fire in a movie theater. You think so? You can you can yell fire in a theater, but then you have to deal with the re- repercussions of, you know, somebody getting trampled and hurt and right. killed. Right. Well, you there better be a fire. Right. There better be a fire. <laughs> if you pull out your carry gun, there better be a reason. Right. But you know what? Uh, to tell you the truth, though, even talking about that, um, open carry is something that's been completely blown out of proportion. There are people that are 100% against it. There are people that are middle of the road like me mm-hmm. that understands uh, under certain circumstances how it works and why it works yep. and how it can actually deter a crime before a crime is committed. I have personal knowledge of that because I watched somebody do it. Wow. Okay. Guy was in a 7-Eleven in free America. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was open carrying. Uh, at the time it was cool out. He had a uh, windbreaker on. There was a dude that was taking 10 minutes to figure out what kind of potato chips he wanted at a point of purchase display. And he was constantly looking in the mirror in the corner of the store 
so that the mirror would capture everything that was moving in the store. So he was casing out the movements of what was going on while he's pretending to select a dollar fifty bag of potato chips. <laughs> Does right. it take Charlie ten minutes to figure out what kind of chips he wants? No, no, not at all. So when the guy that owned the Seven Eleven saw the next guy coming in, who happened to be carrying, he just went like made a hand signal, and the guy looked right at the guy who was checking out the potato chips for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and he just happened to move his happened hand to sweep, it back, to sweep it back a little bit, and that Cockton Lock 1911 just happened to be there. Wow. He instantly figured out what kind of potato chips he wanted, <laughs> and he got out of Dodge. <laughs> Mystery solved. Mystery solved. Wow. Okay. Shot was never fired. Cops were never called. Why? Because an open carrier had a set of balls and knew how to brandish correctly. Mm, the art that? of brandishing is something that goes all the way back to the Old West. Very cool. Now, I'm in the camp that believes that if you're open carrying and something bad goes down, you're, you're going to be the first guy. That That's where I like to lean towards. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know? Agreed. So I'm like, yeah, I don't get open carry. Yeah. I used to, I used to work at a shooting school and the all the guys that worked there open carry. And I'm like, they have a little logo on my shirt with the place where I'm working. They can figure out I'm working there. They can Either shoot. that or just put a big target on your back. Right. I'm like they if the people are taking classes here, the students are here, they see me with the logo on the shirt, they know I'm working here. Yeah. If I'm working at a gun store or a shooting school, then you can assume that I've got a gun on me. We like, may want to turn around soon. Oh, uh, where and anywhere, how? anywhere. It's a Jersey and how. jug handle. All Just right. Be careful. Nobody's coming. Okay. Now, how do we get back to where we came from? Actually, we're just going to retrace our steps the other way. All right. Make a left here and a left at the light. Gotcha. I didn't know if you were taking me in some sort of crazy loop. No. Well, we're going to go. It's easier this way because now we won't be tied up in so much traffic. Cool. All right, what else can we talk about? Well, you had me start about um, doing the pheasant hunting, and I mentioned I yes. used uh, a 10-gauge side-by-side muzzle-loading shotgun. That's a mouthful. Yeah, but I didn't get a chance to tell you that it was uh, it's actually a reproduction from Petersoli. I bought it used when the gun uh, was about 25 years old to begin with. Wow. I paid $400 for it. At the time, it list for seven. Not bad. Deal. And now it's worth about eleven $1 hundred dollars. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and I put an ounce and three quarter a shot, and a little over seventy grains of powder in the thing, and it'll knock a pheasant down, even cylinder bore, uh, thirty five forty yards. Wow, that's cool. And because cylinder bore has widespread, mm -hmm. if something flies over my head, I can literally just go like this. And knock it down. Oh my gosh. That's so it cool. Comes a point and shoot. That's awesome. Yeah. That is way cool. I have, uh, for the last four years, for the last four years, I've been doing an Easter egg shoot. And this year I bought, um, I bought some more little plastic eggs and I bought some peeps. And I throw them up. I just shoot them with my Mossberg 500. Nice. Yeah. That's always entertaining. I had a friend of mine actually do a shoot with Peeps, that same black powder guy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, his son or somebody in the group, I'm not sure which, uh, took some kind of a uh, eyedropper or hypo or whatever mm -hmm. and injected ketchup into the Peep. <laughs> That's a great idea. Splat. All right. <laughs> See what I can do about that. All right. <laughs> I found this out. I used to watch the the like the shooting USA shows. Whenever they have shotgun guys, they hit the target. You know, they hit the clays, and it's just a big cloud of dust. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, how do they do that? That looks really cool. Then I find that they take the um, like the football yard chalk and, and the chalk dust and put that inside. And I'm like, oh, well, that seems like cheating. But I put those, uh, I put, I got some chalk dust that I got from Home Depot, mm -hmm. and I put that inside the eggs, and you, yeah. you see the cloud of dust, and it always looks cool. We do that with the black powder leak with the chalk dust. Yeah? On the plastic eggs. Very and we, cool. And we suspend them with a string tied around the egg, and then you shoot 
uh, uh, the egg to you know completely make it disintegrate. Yeah, and you get the big cloud of dust. Right. Little. It's. It's. You know what I like about shooting shotguns is when you hit the clay, it's completely satisfying. It's like instant gratification. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Sometimes, like. sometimes more gratifying than steel. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Because you actually blow stuff up. It always looks cool. Yeah. When you nail it, it looks cool. You get the big cloud of dust. I did the first one I did a bunch of years ago. I think it was in 2014, maybe. I took my son out. I had a 1522, and um, mine was in camo, and I had him shoot that. And, and we, we stopped in the highway someplace and picked up an orange cone and put a couple of eggs on the orange cone and had him shoot those. That was pretty fun. Mm. Yes, that's uh, anytime you get you know an actual reaction, you know at bullet impact, it's it, it always is, you know adds to the fun. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I started my son when he was four years old. Really? Yes. Very cool. I brought him out to um, a, a range that I used to be a member of, Monmouth County Rifle and Pistol. Yeah. And at the age of four, um, we had a Marlin Little Buckaroo. Uh, 22, mm -hmm. short, long, or long rifle, bolt action. Yeah. No magazine, just a tray. So you just you, a tray. A tray with a bolt action gun. So the tray would automatically feed the round, regardless of the length. Ah. Oh, okay? okay. Right into the receiver. Gotcha. So you do you do shorts, and shorts, long longs, long rifles, CB caps, blanks. Cool. Whatever. That's pretty cool. Yep. I still have that. Yeah? That gun's 25 years old now. <laughs> That's awesome. Brand new, I, I bought it for 150 bucks, And I still use it as a trainer today when I mentor uh, kids. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I do more mentoring now than I do shooting. It's... it's Because uh, of all the two-way activity. It kind of chews up into, uh, you know... Yeah. You know, doing it, all the stuff I used to do. There's there's a lot of people I've talked to that, that spend more time getting the word out or uh, teaching people or being active politically with the Congress people, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, local legislators, then they, then they do shooting because it's, we need to, we need to keep this stuff. Like we really need to keep this stuff passing on to our kids. Yeah. And that was, that was an important thing for me when I, I didn't get into gun ownership until I, until I had a son and then I realized there was someone that I had that I needed to protect. That's when I got into it. And I had my kids shoot when they were four or five years old. I had them learn the gun safety rules when they were, uh, I don't know, four or five, six years old. Mm -hmm. And the rules were simple. The rule was just don't point it at anybody. Mm -hmm. Cool, easy enough. Always have daddy there. Don't touch yeah. it without daddy. Exactly. Yep. I used to keep my son's toy Star Wars guns in with my guns because, you know, we treated with respect and, and we did mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and my kids, uh, I don't want to say they, they like it. They do it with me. We make the uh, Christmas gun gram every year. Uh, sometimes my son will want to come shooting. My daughter, not too much. But uh, having said that, I also took the kids out for an ice cream after every time, every time we went to the range. We'd a good stop, bride. Yeah, we'd stop at McDonald's and get a dollar ice cream cone. There you go. So my daughter one time said, she's like, Dad, how much do I have to shoot in order to get an ice cream cone? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta shoot that so, brick. Right. Gotta shoot that whole brick. <laughs> right. 500 rounds, honey. Right. And then my son would get mad because he's like, I don't want to shoot. I'm just going to sit and read a book. Okay, that's fine. And then we would stop and get an ice cream for me and the girl. And the boy was upset that he didn't get an ice cream. I'm like, you didn't shoot. What do you want me to do? It's no fair. Oh, here we go. I told you what it was. If yeah. you shoot, you get an ice cream. If you this don't is shoot, the drill. You get an ice cream. Yeah. You know the drill. It's what it is. Yeah. Now that my kids are older, I got to take them out to eat. Yeah. A little more costly. A little more costly. Teenagers. Sometimes it's cheaper to put a roof over their head than feed them. <laughs> no kid. Yeah. No I, kid. When I started mine when he was four years old with the little Marlin Buckaroo, mm -hmm. um, I used a Caldwell uh, bean bag, which basically swallowed the whole gun. <laughs> right. So with a chamber flag and an open bolt, you were already safe. Yeah. Okay. Which, you know, really helped it out. And I started him bench resting. Mm -hmm. By the time he was eight... A friend of mine uh, basically gave me um, a side-by-side -side 410 shotgun that uh, somebody uh, had had put uh, uh, slugs through 
and they wrung out the end of the uh, barrel. They, they, mm. they, it was a full choke gun. It was oh, a bird man. gun. And, yeah. and they wrung out the barrel, so he just chopped it. It's still federally legal, but this thing is a, you know, a, a cute little youth side-by-side. -side. Oh, that's cool. And he also chopped the stock on the back. So at age eight, the kid was double tapping, four tens, high brass. Wow. At 15 yards. Holy moly. Knocking over, uh, you know, steel coffee cans. That's way cool. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Maxwell House will, will never be the same. <laughs> My son, uh, I had him on this junior shooting team at the range that I belong to. And they used to meet on Wednesday nights. And it was, it was the thing that we did, you know. And I'd always take him out for ice cream. And I'm like, don't tell your mom. Don't tell your sister. Mm. But there was one night they were having a fun night. And they took... Uh, they took cards, and they put the cards face down on uh, on the target, and there was one little corner where all of the targets were touching. And if you, you know, you, if you hit that spot, then you got something special. So my son actually nailed that spot. Wow. And I went up and got a picture of it, and then I took the cards down, and I uh, made a little, a little, basically a little plaque out of it. I put all the cards together in the same formation. I went from the picture. I printed out the picture, and I put all of it in a little um, uh, a little picture frame. Nice. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I did something similar when my son uh, was shooting a black powder match up in uh, Vernon when he was still in high school. It was a meat shoot, and it was at uh, 60 yards. Wow. And we were shooting a target that had a x-ring probably the size of somewhere between a Kennedy half or an Eisenhower dollar. Very I don't cool. remember the exact uh, size, but this was a 60 yard target and it's called an over the log shoot. So you lay prone mm -hmm. and you actually use a log to lift the shotgun, uh, not the shotgun, the rifle, up off the grass. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And he's pushing out 370 grain uh, conical bullets at about 1,300 feet per second. Holy he's 17 holy. years old, and the power factor on that particular round through that gun is 2.5 times the strength of an AR-15. Wow! And he's shooting that at 17? Yes. That's awesome. All right. I bought him his own black powder gun. He has a globe front sight and a peep on the back. I went to change the uh, uh, the uh, peep, okay, and he goes, I mean, the, uh, the globe on the front, and he goes, no, 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 leave it alone, okay? Yeah. I like it just where it is, because it looks just like our M1 Garand. Whoa. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you won filet mignon at the meat shoot, I'm leaving you alone. <laughs> right, he's got a point. <laughs> yeah, he's got a point, okay? I actually stopped shooting that match. Really? You just so I could up. look through my Nikon spotting scope yeah. and watch him cloverleaf five shots together and get a 49 4X. Wow! That's amazing. At 60 yards. At 60 yards. A cloverleaf. Jeez. That is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that is way cool. Yeah. If it wasn't for college, he'd be a distinguished expert himself. But he went all the way up to the expert rank. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, one notch. One notch. That's cool. All right, listen, we are going to finish things up here because um, we're almost where we need to be. How can people find CNJFO? Well, the easiest way to do it is either on Facebook through our CNJFO Facebook page, or you can hit us up online at cnjfo.com. All right, very cool. Okay, so some other stuff I need to put in. Please make sure you check out the Self-Defense Radio Network. SDRN.US is the website. It's all of your pro-freedom podcasts in the same place. Please like and share the Writing Shotgun with Charlie on Facebook and on... Uh, I forget the other stuff. I know you can find Writing Shotgun Podcast on iTunes. You can find it on Spotify. You can now find it on iHeartRadio. Please like and share and support Rosie and the CNJFO and all of the great things that are going on. We will talk to you later. Rosie, thank you so much. Thank you, Charlie. It's been all a right. pleasure taking a ride. I appreciate it, man. And we will talk to you guys later. <laughs>